Okay. Okay, so is my screen showing? Okay, uh, thanks all for coming. So today we will be finishing our uh, lecture for and uh, set of notes. Okay, so so and then we will be starting something new called mathematical induction. So first of all, so we will see that in some of the mathematical arguments, uh, it is stated in the form of there exists something that it is going to be true. So so. Roughly speaking, so we, we can say that all these types of statements, they are of this form. There exists x, p, x. And then, in order to, to, to show that this is true, one method is called the existence proof. So how do we do, do so? We just simply find a particular element, a particular value of x such that p, x is true. So if we can find such a, a, an item or an element, we call this a witness. So, so in that case, this is the, the, the case. And this type of proof of existence proof is called a constructive existence proof. So we really show that something is exist by constructing a particular example that it works. But on the other hand, we will also have non-constructive existence proof. And then this is very interesting. We will show an example in this class. Okay, so for instance, the first one is an example. So here it says that show that there is a positive integer that can be expressed as the sum of cubes of positive integers in two different ways. So we want to find some integer such that it is equal to a cube plus b cube, and it is also equal to c cube plus d cube for some integer a, b, c, and d. So one such example is this number, 1729. And it turns out that this, this number can be expressed as the cube of 1 plus the cube of 12. And also it can be expressed as the cube of 9 plus the cube of 10. Now this number has a very interesting story. So I have talked about this in the OCW recording. But just in case you haven't uh, viewed that, so this is called the... Uh, Ramanujan Hardy number. So there is a story about a very uh, famous mathematician called Hardy with his genius student called Ramanujan. So Ramanujan is a genius from India. He didn't receive any proper mathematical training, so he studied mathematics by himself. But interestingly, he has a lot of very, very uh, crazy ideas. And then he has actually proven a lot of uh, theorems that nobody has ever imagined before. So when he, he was in India, he sent an mail, not an email, he sent a mail to, to Hardy and then expressing what his findings and then Hardy decided to invite him to, to England, to, to Cambridge, to, to, to see him. And it turns out that this Ramanujan and Hardy has a has a very nice uh, relationship after that. Uh, but Ramanujan, one, one time, he, he was sick and then he was uh, admitted to a hospital. So Hardy uh, visited him, but Hardy is a guy who, who, seldom, who seldom speaks a lot. So he's, Hardy is very shy. So he, he, was, he, he was thinking about uh, what to be... Uh, what, what things to chat with Ramanujan while uh, he is visiting him. So, so in the end, so when, when, they, when they met, so Hardy mentioned that he, he was uh, taking a taxi to the hospital and the taxi number is 1729. And then he mentioned to Ramanujan that, oh, he, find, he found this number very boring because he can't find any special property of this number. But Ramanujan, a very yeah, crazy person, yeah, a genius, he immediately told Hardy that 
This number is really special. It is the smallest positive integer that can be expressed as the sum of cubes in two different ways. So because of this, then we now have this story and then we, we call this number uh, Ramanujan Hardy number. Okay, now this is an example of a constructive existence proof because we show the existence result is correct and we really construct a particular example, a witness to, to show that it is true. Now on the other hand, we have another example. So this time this example is, we want to show that, okay, there is some irrational number R and some other irrational number S. Okay, so RS are two irrational numbers, but they can actually be the same. We have no restriction, such that R to the power S is rational. Now, recall that what is a rational number? So rational number are numbers that can be expressed as ratio between integers. And we have already shown some irrational number exists. So square root 2 is an irrational number. We have proven that before. Okay, But here, very strangely, we want to show that there is some irrational number to the power of another irrational number such that the resulting will be rational. Now, this is something also quite crazy. And then, uh, so, so, so in the lecture, so this time, yeah, please visit the OCW recording for details. In the lecture, we, we have considered this special number, square root 2 to the power square root 2 and this number to the power square root 2. Now, we didn't claim, so not in the lecture yet, we, we didn't claim that this is the number that we want. But what we claim is that either square root 2 to the power square root 2 is rational, so that we can find our result, or square root 2 to the power square root 2 is irrational, but then square root 2 to the power square root 2 to the power of square root 2, it must be now rational because it is now equal to 2. So in either case, whether this number square root 2 to the power square root 2 is rational or not, we show that there must exist the resulting two numbers R and S such that R to the power S is rational. So we don't know which case it is. Could be R is equal to square root 2, S is equal to square root 2. This may be one possible scenario, we don't know. <coughs> or this whole number is the R that we have and the square root 2 is s. So in either of these cases, one of these cases must happen because this number is either rational or irrational. <coughs> uh, excuse me. So if this number is rational, then we are done. This is r, this is s. But if this is irrational, then this whole thing is r, this is s. So this is the idea. So the proof that we have is we show that the existence result is correct. But we didn't give a particular example showing that it is correct. We don't know which is the case. We didn't show it. But we know that it is the case. One of them must happen. So this is a kind of a non-constructive proof. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So so now we have studied a lot of uh, different proving techniques, but we have also need to be careful because there can be a lot of mistakes going on when we are doing proving. So this is one famous example. So in this example, we try to show that one is equal to two, but obviously it is wrong. Let's find out where it goes wrong. So we will have a wrong proof here, but let's see. So we let a be a positive integer, and then b is equal to a. So b is another positive integer, and then we set b is equal to a. So this is the given case, a is equal to b, and so when we multiply both sides by a, then we get a squared is equal to ab, and then we subtract b squared from both sides, we get a squared minus b squared is equal to ab minus b squared. Now from 3, we can do factorization. So a squared minus b squared is a minus b 
times a plus b, and a b minus b squared, we take away b so that we have a minus b as a result. Now because both sides, we will have a minus b, we will divide both sides by a minus b so that we will get a plus b is equal to b as a result. Now if we get back to, to 1, a is equal to b, so we substitute this a by b. So the left hand side becomes 2 times b, 2 times b is equal to b, and so finally 2 is equal to 1. So we show that 2 is equal to 1. Now there's something wrong. Actually, for this whole proof, there is just one line with, with, which is wrong. But then, if there is one line that is wrong in the proof, then this means that the whole proof would be wrong. So, so, so it is a very strict requirement. So it is not like you will get partially correct when, 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 when you have when you have most of the claims to be correct and just one wrong. So, so, so. Let's say your proof has 100 lines, but one of them is wrong, then you don't get 99%. You get 0% for, for a wrong proof. Now, the problem here is this one. So here, from line 4 to line 5, we were doing the division by a minus b. But here, what is a minus b? So a minus b is actually 0. So for division on both sides, we can do so. And so we can do so in every case except we cannot divide both sides by zero so it doesn't make sense to to do division by zero so in that case it turns out that a minus b here itself this time a is equal to b so a minus b itself is actually zero so from step four to step five there is something wrong so this is just this this line a plus b is equal to b the derivation of this line is wrong it makes the whole thing wrong okay Another, let's see another common mistakes. Okay, so here we want to show that n, if n squared is even, let's say n is an integer, and then if n squared is an even integer, then n is even. So we want to show something like this. Now notice that this argument or this statement itself is correct. But what we are showing here is a wrong proof for a correct statement. Okay, so, so let's see where it goes where it goes wrong. Now the proof says, suppose that n squared is even, so so far so good, right? Because we are trying to use a direct proof method. So what we can do here is we assume that the first part here is correct and then we hope to get the second part as our conclusion. So we suppose n squared is even, so so far so good, right? So because n squared is even, then we can have n squared is equal to 2k for some integer k. Now, the next one says, so now we let n is equal to 2 times m for some integer m. Now, because n is equal to 2 times m for some integer m, then n must be even. Okay, what's wrong? Or why I am saying that it is wrong? So this second line is okay. <clears throat> it is because we have already assumed that n squared is even. So n squared must be equal to 2 times k for some integer k. So this is a... This part is a logical consequence of the first part of something that is written before. But the next one, there is some problem. So how can we let n is equal to 2m? So there is no particular reason why we can do this. There is no evidence at this moment that n is an even number. And if n, there, we don't know whether n is even or not, how can we write n is equal to 2m for some integer m? So this is really the problem that we have. And actually, recall that for this particular statement, it is rather difficult to prove it by using a direct proof. But on the other hand, it is super easy if we use proof by contraposition. So instead of proving P implies Q, we prove not Q implies not P. So to show this statement, we show if N is not even, then N squared is not even. So this is what we want to show. And then this can be easily done. Okay, so we have talked about two common mistakes. And then let's see, another one. Okay. So here it says that if x is a real number, then x squared is positive. 
Now we will comment whether this statement is wrong or correct later. But let's see the proof. So the proof says that there are two cases. The first case is x is positive. The second case is x is negative. So if x is positive, then x squared is going to be positive. On the other hand, if x is negative, then x squared is also positive. So because we have two cases, and then we show that these two cases will lead to the same conclusion. So in that case, the original statement will be correct. Now, actually, this is a wrong statement. And the reason is that when x is a real number, there is a chance that x is neither positive nor negative. So the only case that we are mentioning here is when x could be equal to 0. Okay, so 0 is not positive, 0 is not negative. So when x is equal to 0, then what will happen? Then 0 squared is not positive and it is also not negative, right? So in that case, there is something wrong. So the wrong here it is because when we are showing proof by cases, we really need to have all these cases to cover all the possible scenarios. So x is a real number. Okay, then, <clears throat> then we, we do not just have two cases. We will need to have at least one more case to cover the, var the variation that x could be equal to zero. Okay, now because this is not a complete coverage of all the possible scenarios, this proof by cases does not work. Okay, now how about... Uh, so, so this is a, a case where you want to, so we have studied a lot of proving techniques, but, but then when you are left on your own, then, then what you can do is, of course, if you have some idea of, of proving it, like maybe using a direct proof or a proof by contra position, then yeah, try this first. But if you have somehow not very much idea how to show this, see if you have seen something that is similar before. So one idea of getting approved for what you want to do is we adapt, we change, or we modify some of the existing proof so that it may work for you already. So this time, so suppose that we want to show that square root 3 is irrational. So, so when we want to show this, so this is actually correct, okay. Then when, when you want to uh, prove this, perhaps you can recall that you have known how to show square root 2 is irrational. Now perhaps you can take out your memory of how to show square root 2 is irrational and see if you can use the same proof idea to modify the proof of square root 2 is irrational so that it now fits for this case. Okay, so in the, in the class, in the OCW recording, we have demonstrated how this works. But you need to be careful, okay? Just make sure that you don't, you will need to have the correct uh, cases covered so that uh, although the same idea work may work, okay, but you need to be careful at each step because you are now proving a different statement. If I remember correctly in the recording, we will also ask you to try to, so so now suppose that you you have already know how to show square root two is rational, but then to test really to test your understanding, see if you can modify the proof and try to show square root four is irrational. Now if you can modify the proof and show square root four is irrational, then that means that you are not fully understanding everything. It is because square root four itself is equal to 2, and 2 is a rational number. So really, to test your understanding, you, you need to see why changing the proof of square root 2 is rational can help to show square root 3 is irrational. But on the other hand, it will, it will get into trouble when you try to show square root 4 is irrational. Okay? So test your understanding. Okay, another way is sometimes maybe it is difficult to prove a certain statement directly. But then, somehow, if you can find a certain statement P that you know it is already correct, 
And then you, you can also show that P implies Q is correct. Then we can use modus ponens to show Q is correct. Is that okay? So, so instead of showing Q, then what we want to do something here is tricky. So we may, we may try to change the problem a little bit. We show that P implies Q is true. And then we also show P is true. Maybe P implies Q is true is easier to show. And also maybe P itself is easier to show. So then together with this, so the original target is just Q, but instead of Q, we create two statements, P and P implies Q, and show these two statements instead. So this idea is called backward reasoning. So we try to move backward a little bit so that so so that we can we can step forward later to show Q directly. So this is an example. <clears throat> Now, we want to show that for distinct positive real numbers x and y, 0 0.5 x plus y will be greater than uh, will be greater than x y to the power 0 0.5. So actually, this is the this is what this is the very famous AM GM inequality. So the arithmetic mean, the average of two real numbers, is always greater than the geometric mean. So the geometric mean is also kind of an average, but it is the geometric average. We multiply the two numbers, but then we take the square root. Okay, so our arithmetic mean is greater than the geometric mean. No, so <clears throat> so this is our backward reasoning. So this statement may be difficult to prove, but then we know that if we can prove zero point two five of x plus y squared is greater than x y, then we will have this one. So in that case, we can easily show that this is correct. Statement one is correct. So our focus will now be changed to prove this part is that. But in order to prove this part, we also know that if we can show statement two, x plus y squared is greater than four x y, then automatically we will have zero point two five x plus y squared is greater than x y. So in order to so statement two is correct and statement one is correct. So our task is remaining to show the first part. This premise of statement two is also correct, but we will see that in order to show this, we can show statement three and then change our problem to showing the first part of statement three and so on and so forth. So in the end, let's say we go to statement five already and statement five, after you show this, you transfer the problem into showing that X minus Y, this number, the square of it is greater than zero. And now, finally, we are done because x minus y is non-zero because x and y are distinct positive real numbers. So x and y, they are non-zero. So x minus y will either be positive or negative. So, so the square of it must be greater than zero. So now, once we are done, we know that 6 and then 5 will imply this part and then together with 4 will imply this part and so on and so forth. So by a sequence of modus ponens, then we will get our final result in the end. So the idea of backward reasoning is in order to show a certain thing to be correct, we may show some other thing instead and transfer our original question of showing this into another question of showing something else. And then this will work. Okay. And finally, uh, for this set of slides, so we end it with some interesting example. So so the first one is, so consider a checkerboard. So a standard checkerboard has eight times eight squares. And we want to cover the checkerboard by using these dominoes. So domino is a one by two or two by one thing. So by means of covering, we want every square on the checkerboard to be covered. But then it is covered exactly by only one piece of domino. So the domino pieces cannot overlap each other. Now for this one, then it is yes. So how can we do so? So you just give an example. So just tower domino one here, domino two here, domino three here, domino four here, and repeat doing this. So for the remaining, so we can really tile the checkerboard nicely, perfectly with domino pieces. And then this is a, what kind of a proof we have. This is an existence proof and it is a constructive existence proof. Okay. Now, if we change to 
something else. So this time, suppose that the top left corner of this this checkerboard is removed. So so can we still cover the checkerboard with domino pieces? Now the answer is no. The reason is is that because each domino piece has to be covering two squares. Suppose that it can cover the 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 this checkerboard nicely. Then that means that the number of squares on this checkerboard has to be even. But on the other hand, the number of squares on this particular checkerboard there are there are only sixty three squares, which is not even. So there is a contradiction. So in that case, the original claim that we can cover the checkerboard with domino tiles is wrong. Okay. So here we are using proof by contradiction. So you can also use some other proof techniques like proof by contraposition or whatever to to do the same thing. Okay. But but here this is an example of using the proof by contra uh, contradiction technique to show this is not possible. Now how about this one? Now this time suppose that we are removing a top left corner and a bottom right corner. So this time we still want to ask if it is possible to cover the whole board with domino pieces, and then the answer is still no. Now, but then we will find out that the previous proof doesn't work. The previous proof here we checked about odd and even, right? Yeah, there are still even number of squares on the on the checkerboard here, so we cannot simply claim that oh, because domino pieces must cover two squares and it has to be covering even number in total but then here is even so there's nothing wrong nothing wrong that we can see here so we have a tricky observation in that so we will see that if you put a domino piece to cover any two squares on this checkerboard it must always it must always be covering one white and one black square Okay, so what does that mean? So if we are covering the checkerboard using domino pieces, the number of squares that we cover must have this idea. It must have the same number of white squares and the same number of black squares because each time a domino piece covers one white and one black. So the number of white and number of black covers by a group of domino pieces has to be the same. But if you look at this example, how many white and how many blacks? So after doing some careful counting, we will see that there are more whites than blacks. Okay, so originally 32 whites, 32 blacks, but then we are removing the corners. So we have still 32 whites, but then there are there are only 32 blacks. So so that we can't cover it. Now in your homework two, one of the question is a related one. So in that homework. This time we are removing what? We are removing one of the white square and one of the black square. So the the question there was to ask you show that in such a case, then we can always we can always cover the checkerboard with domino pieces. Okay, so that's that's for that part. Okay, so so now we have ended uh, the discussion on lecture four. So how about lecture five? So let's see. So lecture five. So in this lecture, we are going to introduce a new proof technique called mathematical induction. And so we will talk about what is meant by mathematical induction. And then this is for this class. And then for the next class, we will talk about a another variation called strong induction and then we will also talk about some common mistakes okay so okay so let's see this particular example okay so if you look at the sum of the first n positive odd integers what will happen the first one is one if you add the first two you will have four one plus three is equal to four if you add the fir first three of them you will get nine and then you'll get 16 and you'll get 25. Now a very careful observation will allow you to see that the numbers, 
the resulting sum will be very regular. It will have a pattern. So it is 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and they are actually square numbers. Moreover, right? So moreover, when you are summing, let's say three numbers, three odd integers, the smallest three odd integers, you will get three square as a result. And if you are summing the first four of them, you will get four square as a result. So somehow, this observation will, will, will urge you to, to, to see that, oh, is it really true? Is it for any case that the sum of the first n positive integers will be equal to n squared? Is it really correct for every n? So, so yeah, so here the reasonable guess is the sum is equal to n squared for the sum of the first n positive in odd integers. Now, if we want to show this is correct, so we want to show that for all n, the sum of the first n odd positive integer is equal to n squared. So we, we are showing some statement of the form for all n pn. Okay, so here, the pn here is the sum of the first n positive odd integers is n squared. Okay, and we want to show that for all n pn. So one very cool idea is instead of showing infinite number of cases because there are infinite possible n that we need to consider we are going to show two statements one we want to show that the case when n is equal to one is correct so this is usually called the basic step we take it as a base and then the next one is we want to show for every n, if pn is true, then pn plus 1 will be true. Now, this is called the inductive step, and the domain of n are all positive integers. Okay, now if we can show this one is true and this one is true, then we can show that for all n, pn is true. Now, the reason of this is, is that because p1 is true, and also for p for the second one, we know that we have p1 implies p2 is true, p2 implies p3 is true, p3 implies p4 is true, and so on and so forth. So with p1 and p1 implies p2 is true, we get p2 is true. And now we know that p2 is true, and with p2 implies p3 is true, getting from here, the universal instantiation, we will get p3 is true. Now we have p3 is true, and then with p3 implies p4, we will get p4 is true, and so on and so forth. So in such a case, we can show that for every n, pn is true. Now the good thing here is, good thing here is that originally, although we are still showing for every n, for every n, so the statement 2 here and the original statement, they are somehow similar. We are actually showing that for all the possible ends, it has to be true. But then there is something different. The difference is for what thing that we are going to show. Now in the original thing, we show that Pn is true directly for all the cases. But then in the second case, we show Pn implies Pn plus 1. So what does that mean? So when we want to show something, P, let's say pn plus 1, we can assume that pn is already true and make use of this extra information to help us to show pn plus 1 to be true. So, so, so that's why mathematical induction has a very good, uh, yeah, it's very useful because you can isolate the really difficult part, yeah, based on isolate this from, from the previous cases. Okay, so you have the previous case known to be true and you you can use the information that the previous case to be true to show that the current case is going to be true so it must be easier than just to show something is true without any information okay so actually the the correctness of mathematical induction why mathematical induction works is related to a special mathematical concept called well-ordering property. 
So well Doran properly says that, so this is the statement that it claims. It says that every non-empty collection, every non-empty group, so you have a group of non-negative integers, but then this group contains at least some elements, some, some item, it will have a smallest element. So for instance, let's say I have a group of numbers, let's say uh, 1, 5, 7, 9, 11, something like this. Then in this group, you can find a smallest number. So the smallest number here is 1. Is that okay? Now you will say that, oh, so what, this, why is this special? So first of all, first of all, it's special that if you remove the condition of non-negative, then may, it may not be really correct. So for instance, suppose that you are thinking of the collection of all possible integers, all integers. So this is really your, your, your group of integers. You consider all of them. But then, which one is the smallest? Then you can't tell. Is minus 7 the smallest? No, you can have minus 8. Is minus 8 the smallest? No, you can have minus 9. There is no number called minus infinity. Minus infinity is a concept only. So it is, there is no specific number called minus infinity, right? Whenever you can give me a, a number, then I can always give you a smaller number. So if you change this to remove this non-negative condition, just every non-empty collection of integers has the smallest element, then suddenly it may not be correct. But on the other hand, if you add back every group, every non-empty collection of non-negative integers, it will have a smallest element, then suddenly you will say, oh, yeah, that's true. But then how do you prove it? Yeah, there is no really uh, a good way of proving this. So mathematicians will list this as something that is obviously true, and they will list it as an axiom. Okay, now if you have this axiom known, then you can see that why mathematical induction is correct. So the why it is correct, we are just showing this here, but suppose that we have well-ordering principle, we can have an alternative proof that it is correct. It's not that important, so I will suggest you to read this. So I'm not going to cover it today, but then you can read this and see if you can understand what is going on. Now, to understand why mathematical induction is correct, so if you can convince yourself that, yeah, why showing just these two cases is like you have you are playing with the domino pieces so that yeah so you flip domino you flip the first one so that you will make every other domino pieces fall then then this is the idea so if you understand these ideas then there is no really no need why you need to understand the connection between well ordering principle and the uh, and the correctness of mathematical induction but yeah, but if you are interested in it, yeah, you can see this. It's interesting that because well-ordering property is correct, so mathematical induction is a correct method. But on the other hand, suppose that mathematical induction is a correct method of proving things, then you can sh show that well-ordering principle, well-ordering property here must also be correct. So actually, this one, the correctness of mathematical induction, and the correctness of well-ordering property, they are logically equivalent. So this is something that that is, I think, interesting. Okay. Okay, let's go back to our original example. So now we have the idea of mathematical induction and see if we can use this to show our conjecture. So we guess that, we guess this Pn, we guess that the sum of the first n positive odd integers is n squared is going to be correct for every n. So as an example to do this, so let's use the method. So we will need to prove the basic step and we will also need to show the inductive step, okay? Now for the basic step, it is easy. The basic step talks about the case when n is equal to one. So, so what is P1? So P1 is the sentence or the statement, the sum of the first one positive odd integers is one squared. And it is obviously true because the first one odd integer is one, and then one is equal to one square, so it is correct. So usually the basic step is usually very easy to show. Now the next part is the inductive step. 
So the inductive step is for every n, we want to show that if pn is correct, then pn plus 1 is correct. So, so to show this, we focus on an arbitrary chosen k, and then see if pk implies pk plus 1 is true, and then we have no particular restriction on k, except that k is an integer. k is a positive integer only. We just have this restriction. k is a positive integer. And then for any arbitrary k, we want to see whether pk implies pk plus 1 is true. Now, if you can do so, then the universal generalization will, will, will just show that for every npn implies pn plus 1 is true. Okay? Okay, now, so... So for a particular k, a particular positive integer k, we want to show pk implies pk plus 1. So we can use direct proof. Suppose that pk is true. So we suppose pk is true. Using this as an assumption, we hope to get pk plus 1 is true in the conclusion. Okay, so let's see the details. So suppose that pk is true. So what does that mean? So let's list out what is pk. So pk is the sum of the first k positive odd integers is k squared. Okay, so what does that mean? So it implies that, so this is, pk is true implies that the sum of the first k positive integer, which is 1 plus 3 plus 5 up to 2k minus 1, it is equal to k squared. Now, so we have this one assumed to be correct. And I hope that this will help us to show pk plus 1. Now, what is pk plus 1? So pk plus 1 talks about the sum of the first k plus 1 positive integer, right? So we really want to find out what is the sum of the first k plus 1 positive integer. So the sum of the first k plus 1 positive integer will be equal to 1 plus 3 plus everything up to 2k minus 1. So this is the first k, and then we add one more. The next one will be 2k plus 1. Now, because that we have assumed the inductive so this, this part, we assume that pk is true. So we know that we can replace the first k numbers here by k square. Okay. So, so the whole equation here will, will be equal to, so the whole part here will be equal to k square plus 2k plus 1. And then using our high school algebra, we know that this is equal to k plus 1 whole square. So what does that mean? This sentence here is just showing that the sum of the first k plus 1 positive odd integers is equal to k plus 1 squared. So this is exactly pk plus 1. So we start by assuming pk is true and we get pk plus 1 as a result. So now this is the, the part that we, are, we, we need to do. We have finished the inductive step. So once the yeah, so, so once the basic step and the inductive step are proven, then by the principle of mathematical induction, we show the original thing. For every n, pn will be true. Okay? Yeah, so, so this is a comment. Okay, so we will see that there are good things about mathematical induction, but there are also bad things about mathematical induction. Good thing here is that we can show infinite many cases is true by just showing two statements. And then one of the statements, although it is still showing infinite number of cases to be correct, but it is an easier statement than, than the original one because we can have information. But then, in order to apply mathematical induction, we have to know what to be proved before. So, we, so for instance, suppose that this is our original question. Suppose that what is the sum of the first n positive integers? Suppose that we are asking this, then we don't know what it is. But only after we have done some observation, we guess the formula. And once we have guessed the formula, we can then prove it by using mathematical induction. So the use of mathematical induction is you somehow need to guess the answer first. And then this is the technique to verify to check whether your guessing is correct. Okay, so this is something that is not very good because we still need to have a guess at the beginning before we, we can prove things to be correct. Okay, 
So this is this is the the drawback of using mathematical induction. Okay, now we have more integers. Uh, sorry, more more examples. So these are covered in the in the class, but let's go through it very quickly, so that we show that for all positive integer n, n has to be less than two to the power n. So again, here we can show the basis case when n is equal to one, it is correct, and then we simply assume that for the general case k, suppose that k is less than two to the power k. Then we want to argue why k plus 1 will be less than 2 to the power k plus 1. And then to show that it is not that difficult because k plus 1 is going to be less than or equal to k plus k, right? And then k plus k is equal to... Sorry, let me see. So k plus 1 is less than or equal to k plus k. Is that okay? And then... Because k already is less than 2 to the power k, so k plus k will be less than 2 to the power k plus 2 to the power k, so we get what we want. So this is an easy example. Now the next one is, we want to show that for all positive integer n, n cubed minus n is divisible by 3. Now again, this is an example that we have talked about in the, in the class, so you can check the OCW recording. But for this one, you can obviously show this by mathematical induction because it is an example here. But the better method here is to, to see that you can factorize n cubed minus n to be n minus 1 times n times n plus 1. So n cubed minus n represents the product of three consecutive integers. Now for three consecutive integers, one of them has to be a multiple of three. So in that case, n cubed minus n must always be divisible by three. So in that case, you will see that you can prove the same thing using two different ideas, two different techniques. One is you can prove it by mathematical induction. Okay, done. You show that it is correct. But the other way, you are showing that n cubed minus three and uh, minus n is a product of three consecutive numbers, and one of them must be a multiple of three, so it is divisible by three. So this time, this proof, you can actually see the property of n cubed minus n, and explain why this property will lead to the result. And I think the second proof here contains more information; is a better proof than the original one. So mathematical induction only gives you a way to check your guessing, whether it is correct or wrong, but in order to give, give some color, give some meaning to why it is correct, then perhaps you will need to find another proof technique. Okay, and example three is also a, a very famous uh, formula. So it is about the sum of the first uh, n square numbers. So, so you can do this yeah, by yourself uh, before checking the OTW recording, okay? Okay, now, the method of mathematical induction normally assumes that the basic step starts from n is equal to 1. But there is no particular reason why we must always start with n is equal to 1. Perhaps we can start with n is equal to k as the basic step for some integer k. Now, if this is the case, and suppose that we can also show the second part, the inductive step, then what, what we can have is, instead of showing that for every n that are positive integer, pn is true, we can show that for every n, such that n is greater than or equal to k, so I'm using the shorthand notation here, for every n which is greater than or equal to k, pn will be correct. Okay, so... So we have some example here. So for this one, we want to show that for all positive integer n, if n is greater than or equal to 4, then 2 to the power n is smaller than n factorial. So n factorial is n times n minus 1 up to 1. Okay, so n factorial is, you start from an integer, you multiply uh, those smaller, smaller integers of it until it is equal to 1. Okay. Now, if, if you look at it, so this one is not true when n is equal to 
1. Now when n is equal to 1, the left hand side is 2 to the power 1 which is 2, the right hand side is 1 factorial. It is also not correct when n is equal to 2, because 2 to the power 2 is 4, and 2 factorial is only 2. It is also not correct when n is equal to 3, because the left hand side is going to be 2 to the power 3 which is 8, and the right hand side is 3 factorial which is 3 times 2 times 1 which is 6. But we don't care. What we care are all the integers n greater than or equal to 4. So, so for this particular thing, we can show the basic step. 2 to the power 4 and 4 factorial. The relationship is 2 to the power 4 which is 16 and 4 factorial is 24 and 16 is really smaller than 24. We can show that the basic step is correct by using n is equal to 4 as the basic step. And then again, we can use inductive step uh, we can show that the inductive step is correct. So after we can show these two, we show that for every n greater than or equal to 4, this one is correct. Now, the next example is, this time we want to show for all non-negative integer n, we have this one to be correct. So this time, we will set 0 to be the basic case. Is that okay? And then we need to be a little bit careful. So when we are doing the inductive step, so when we choose for an arbitrary k, the property of k now is a non-negative integer rather than it is a positive integer. So, so we need to be a little bit careful. So when we have changed our basic step, then the corresponding property of integers or, or that you have assumed uh, to, 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 to for, for the integer n to follow must also be uh, uh, the restriction on the integer k that you choose as an arbitrary one when doing the inductive step. Okay, so recall. Yeah, so <coughs> recall what? Uh, excuse me, so let me see. Yeah, because remember we are the inductive step we are using we show for arbitrary k pk implies pk plus one so that we can use universal generalization so in that case if you have a new restriction about n so let's say n is greater than or equal to four then you can assume that the k here that you you see will automatically uh, be considering those cases where you are picking a arbitrary k such that it is an integer greater than or equal to four you can use that okay and, but also you need to be careful. So for instance, here we are talking about n is a non-negative integer. So when you show pk implies pk plus 1, so the property of k is greater than or equal to 0 rather than greater than or equal to 1. So we need to be careful. Now, example 6 is another, is another case. So for this particular thing, we can show that it is always divisible by 57. We can easily show this by induction. This is something easy. But on the other hand, is there a proper way to explain or to observe that this number is divisible by 57? So this is going to be, yeah. You will not, you will need to require some extra effort to find out why it is related to 57, okay? And there is an interesting example in the class. So I will leave it for you to check, but I will explain this ex example here. The, uh, the statement, okay. So here it is about a snowball fight game. There are odd number of people around, so 2n plus 1 people. So you can assume that n is greater than or equal to 1. So there are at least 3 people around. So each of the person that we are looking at, they have a snowball uh, at his hand. And then each one of them must, okay, so we have already this decided how they are going to throw the snowball. So they are going to throw the snowball always to the nearest person. And then we assume that all the distances between any two persons, they are different. They are always different. So, so, so that every one of them must know how to throw a snowball to which, which, which other person. Yeah, because the distances are all different. So there must be a particular one which is closest to you. Show that. So here, the last part is interesting. So we want to show that at least 
one of the present here in this scenario is not hit by any snowball. Now notice that the third part, this the third part here, the distance R distinct is important. So, so for instance, suppose that the distance can be the same. So assume that let's say we have three kids, they are standing on the vertices of an equilateral triangle. So that so let's say the kids are standing at A B C, A B has distance one. B, C has distance 1, and C, A has also distance 1. Yeah, on the, on the playground. Okay. So they are all having equal distance, right? And then, yeah, because our requirement is to throw it to the nearest one. So for A, the nearest one could be B, C. For B, the nearest one could be A, C, and so on and so forth. So in that case, there could be a scenario that A throws a snowball to B, B throws his snowball to C, and C throws his snowball to A. Is that okay? So in that case, everyone will be hit by a snowball. But on the other hand, here, in this example, when we add this restriction, assume that the distances are all distinct, then there must be one is not hit. Then it's going to be one. So go home and see if you can show this to be correct by using induction. Okay, so I think that's all for today. And next Monday, I'm sorry that I will be away from Sinchu for a, uh, for a conference. So I will see how we can arrange our tutorial next week. So the tutorial next, uh, so the next tutorial that was originally supposed to be on Monday, 10 a.m. It is going to be about some other questions in homework two. So I will, I will make arrangement for you and then yeah, please, uh, watch out the announcement for, for, for the exact and detail of this tutorial. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me see. Okay, no particular questions seen. So yeah, let's log out. Happy, yeah. Happy weekend. <laughs>